briefly introduce ourselves, and then we just have 20 minutes to give you the state of the art on digital uh, decentralized identity. That's uh, uh, our job, but we'll, we'll do our best. Um, my name is Drummond Reed. Um, I am now uh, uh, director of um, trust services for Avast, who officially merged with Norton LifeLock as of yesterday morning. Um, so uh, I'm Avast Norton LifeLock. I understand there's going to be a new brand here before the end of the year, so that's the best I can do. Um, I'm also um, uh, one of the uh, steering members at the Trust OP Foundation, so I bring some of that perspective. Um, I'll ask each of the other uh, panelists to, to give a brief intro, and then we'll dive into our questions. Hi, I'm Heather Dahl. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Indicio. Our team helps enterprises and governments around the world advance adoption of decentralized identity. It's a tremendous team who is very active in the Hyperledger community across multiple projects, and some of them are here today, so I'm happy to introduce you to our team. Hi. Oh, hi. My name's Kalia Young. Um, I lead a consultancy, Identity Women in Business, and we work with governments, enterprises, and startups around the world trying to figure out these new um, decentralized identity tools, and I'm quite active across a whole range of organizations in the space, Trust of IP, Decentralized Identity Foundation, Credentials Community Group, etc. Great to be here. And hi, uh, my name is Marie Wallace. I'm with IBM. I've spent about 20 years um, building AI solutions um, with IBM. And the last several years, I got really worried, as we all have, about the, the efficacy, the, um, the ethics, and the privacy aspects of AI. So that's what got me attracted to the SSI space. So I spent the last few years building um, SSI solutions for IBM, and the most recent one being IBM Digital Health Pass, which was used during the COVID pandemic. So we're going to start out by just trying to quickly assess where are we right now. And we'll start with uh, Khalil will give us uh, a quick overview, and then uh, Marie and Heather will provide their perspectives. We're just in five minutes, then we'll get to the meat of where we're going to go. Sure. So um, right now, um, self-sovereign identity is um, just past the peak of expectations and heading towards the trough of disillusionment on the Gartner hype cycle. Um, <laughs> So right now is the time to focus on quality, not quantity, and really think about how we um, provide real market value and long-term potential with the technology. Um, and I think it's also an opportunity for us to reflect as a community, individuals, and companies on what real value we're bringing. Because the next phase we're going through is going to be a little bit tough. I would say, um, in talking about the context of the Gartner hype cycle, that we've actually been in the trough of disillusionment, um, especially in the early stages of the pandemic as organizations were looking at what type of identity, and they had been disillusioned with, with this space, but they understood that this was one of the few ways that they could actually start solving some of the complexities around global um, sharing of verified and authentic data. And so they were willing to take a chance. And I see um, that we are actually now starting to pick up and, and, and leave the disillusionment. And we are aggressively um, moving to the, the point of commercial mass scale adoption. So I think we're, we've already um, surpassed where Gartner has said, because by the time they report, it's already at that point a little bit dated. And where we see global enterprises as they are moving to commercial scaling adoption with mainstream users, because the technology you need to do that is available today, and they can build a complete trusted digital ecosystem from start to end with partners um, across the world and deploy now. Yeah, and I and I, I think I would agree as well that that we're that we're um, much that actually COVID has basically given us, given us all a kick in the butt because we've been doing some great work for years. And John, you know, seems to get like in the early days. Um, you've been there since Drummond since the beginning, and 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 Heather. But um, but I think in the last few years, what's happened with COVID is that we had this massive problem. We had this massive need to be able to exchange highly sensitive personal health related data. And, and the thing that's been really proven is that, you know, many, many approaches were considered, but at the end of the day, the only approach that worked across the globe, everywhere from India to Europe to the US, was a decentralized approach. 
any other approach that was tried failed. So that, I think that was the proof in the pudding. It proved two things. One is decentralization is the only way to solve large scale global privacy preserving data exchange. And the second thing is that the technology is there. It works. It's not perfect. We haven't solved all the problems, but we have enough to get started. And those are, I think, that's where I think we are today. And now, as a next step, to, to Kalia's point, the really hard part is now we have to start applying to non-COVID use cases. We have to really start flipping the switch and looking at where else in the world, what other business problems do we need to solve with this technology? And that's the really exciting next step. So now we're going to get to the meat of this, which is what do we need to do now as, as an industry? And uh, you just heard, <clears throat> I want to give an extra shout out to the BC Gov team, and not just for their leadership, but for pressing forward. And as you just heard from John, official announcement that uh, the first government issued uh, digital identity wallet and credential to follow, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be a slowly phased rollout. But you have a government <clears throat> you know, of a sovereign nation saying we're buying into self-sovereign identity. Um, that's just one step. Now we want to hear from all three panelists, what do they think is going to be necessary to, to get to the tipping point? I mean, can I just, can I just follow up? Because I just want to touch on the government point. Um, I think what we need to do, and I don't know if there's any government officials here, anybody from the government, but um, I really think we need to see the public sector step up to the plate and get more engaged um, on two fronts. One is um, being issuers and verifiers, verifiers of credentials. I mean, self-sovereign identity doesn't change the fact that we still have issuers of identity in governments are you know one of the key issues of identity be that driver's licenses passports social security numbers i work in the healthcare space so provider you know identifiers um, and we need to see um, the governments really stepping up and starting to be first class issuers of these identities so that they can see the industry, they can see the use cases. So now verifiers and businesses can say, well, okay, now I have a trusted identity I can integrate into my business process. And the second thing I'd like to see the government starting to do as well is, is starting to stand up some of these infrastructure and doing kind of the type of work BC have done in terms of, you know, things like trusted wallets. Because we, like, and actually Europe is doing this, so that they're actually start, you know, starting to stand up these, these trusted blockchain networks for these types of use cases. Because I think if we think about it, you know, everybody looks at the internet and we think, oh, you know, private enterprises made the internet. But the reality is, as we all know, it wasn't. It was the government with ARPANET. So I'd like to see the government start to really be, the, be an engine for, for helping uh, private enterprises really drive some innovation around this space. I, I think um, from the standpoint of governments, I think, Canada, BC Gov, and I also think we have to highlight the government of Aruba. Um, during COVID, they were another um, government who used decentralized identity to help fuel the start of their um, economy, which is dependent on tourism. Um, but what, what they have also done is they're taking a leadership position in another part of the world and saying, come join us in the Caribbean, in Latin America, and in Europe. Um, as well in developing decentralized identity solutions based on the trusted digital ecosystem that they developed during COVID because what was very interesting about what they did was although it was for COVID, they built the system to scale to other use cases that they knew they had. But what was more interesting was the realization you don't need government to start building. So what do we need to do? build and build and build and build and build. You can start building today. It is hard. It is hard work to build and get in there and get on the ground and working with people and day in, day out, working with the people in the apps and the wallets and how are they using it and the governments and, and the different agencies and the, you know, the, the hotels or the nightclubs or the casinos or wherever you're deploying your solution. That is hard work. And, Building doesn't just mean the technology that you have to build. You have to look at your organization from the full 360. You have to build through your marketing team, your communications team, your general counsel and legal office, your human resources, your C-suite, your sponsors. There is no part of your organization that doesn't get touched in a fully successful deployment. So when I talk about build, build absolutely through the community, build your technology, but build how you're going to deploy and succeed with everyone else on your team that may not be in your exact tech team, because that 
is how we succeed, and it's by bringing our entire team, our full 360 together, that's going to drive this forward to the scale that we have all been hoping for for a number of years. So um, to build on what Marie said last week, the U.S. Um, uh, immigration services announced that they're going to be issuing digital green cards using the verifiable credential standards. So okay. that's now out in public, which is really excellent news. But I think um, building on what Heather said, it's really important that we start to be market driven instead of technology driven um, and really listen to the needs of what businesses um, care about in terms of problem solving. Um, I think it's important that we make more space for business leaders in the development of our open standards and the open source code. Um, I think we have to have realistic conversations about what the tech can do um, and not pursue just purist approaches that have good intentions but are not necessarily consumable by the market. Um, you know, I think. We, we have had some pretty grand schemes. We just put a lot of work into the Good Health Pass um, blueprint. It was a very excellent piece of work, but it got very little market adoption, right? So that's a lesson to all of us to really get more grounded and aim big, but start small. And we aimed big and started big, and <laughs> it, it, it played out in certain ways. Um, and I think we have to, um, Thinking about these market dynamics is the technology folks really need to slow down and listen carefully to what the market wants. To not just in, think about what we want the market to want. Um, so, and I, I think we also, there's use cases everywhere for this technology. It's sort of like they drip from the sky. And that's good, except we have to figure out where the business cases are and the early business cases that can help business decision makers go, oh yeah, okay, if you can do this and solve this problem for us, it's worth the investment and not just the, yes, we, many of us are idealistic and some of us have been working on this for decades. Um, but we're, we're in this point where we have a huge opportunity if we can shift our focus just slightly towards the market. Um, so I'll leave it at that. It's, these are really, really good points. Um, I'll share that uh, my perspective has, has evolved a lot in the last six months because for over 20 years, I had only been working with startups in you know, tackling these problems. And each, each sort of phase of our evolution towards what's now SSI and decentralized identity um, and then Evernim was acquired by Avast last December. And then, as I mentioned just yesterday, it was official that Avast has been acquired by Norton LifeLock. And there will be a whole new brand here by the end of the year. But the bigger impact is it means uh, 500 million consumers that are customers of, of those combined companies are in a position to be uh, <clears throat> influenced to adopt this technology within the next year, right? And that's just those companies. I think we all are, are well aware, um, Apple and Google both have already introduced support for um, one form of a verifiable credential <laughs> in, uh, uh, in, in, in their digital wallets. And <clears throat> so there, there is, uh, and then with the EU's focus on their digital identity wallet initiative, and frankly, more government funding here in the EU than anywhere else in the world for um, SSI, by the way, they're not afraid to use that term either. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. Um, it, it, it means that the, the collective realization that digital wallets and digital credentials are here to stay is there, and now we are into the very, very hard questions. Okay, so what will real adoption look like? And I, I just want to reinforce, I completely agree with the panelists. It is about small steps. I like to point out even you know, world-changing technologies like um, the, the, the personal computer, it wasn't, it did, didn't happen overnight. It was one killer app at a time. Even the internet, it was, wow, you can start to use email, and bingo, it, it spreads. That's what I think is gonna happen here. 
So we just have uh, a few minutes left. If we've intrigued you enough, what we want now want to answer is <clears throat> what specifically, what project or, or organization, if you're interested in this and you want to say, how do I do something else, where do you go? What do you do? Well, you're in the right place. This is a great place to start. There's so many people here. But where do you start? Um, there are a number of um, community um, meetings. Um, in fact, on the NDCO website, we have a page that just is a guideline of all the meetings and with links on exactly where you can sign up or how to join um, the meeting rooms. Um, there are also trainings. Um, the NDCO team offers a lot of hands-on training, no matter whether you're like, I've heard about this and I want to learn more, all the way to you've been doing this for years and you need to learn how to use a very specific code base. And then lastly, um, there are a lot of meetups, and um, all of our organizations offer them. And DCO does one every third Tuesday. And for those of you who are in the space with us, you may be not be on stage, but I encourage you to continue to offer um, information and content. And DCO publishes reports on a regular basis in a library for anyone to use. I encourage any companies in this space to do the same thing because I think together we can build this really strong community library of all kinds of materials to help advance adoption. Um, so this morning, um, Daniela announced the Getting Started with SSI course. So myself and my colleague Lucy um, wrote that. So we're that's one place to learn. Um, there's a forum that I've been hosting since 2005 called the Internet Identity Workshop. Oh, actually, you haven't come yet. You came <laughs> virtually, so you have. But um, So that's a great place to really, if you want to dive into the deep end of the swimming pool, that's where we hang out. Um, our next one's coming up in November. And um, I also publish a weekly newsletter about the industry. Um, called Identisphere, and people love it. We send out the news of what's happened this week related to SSI and neighboring technologies. Um, I, I, I definitely agree. I think being involved in the community, this is a really good, it's a good, good community. It's vibrant. I think it's, I mean, I don't think I've ever worked in a space where people are so passionate. I think it's because she one of the earliest speakers to talk about the, the use case they had, you know, protecting women. Um, and, I, and I think the thing about SSI is that we all care about our identity. We all care about being safe on the internet. So I think the people that get into the space feel passionately about making the digital world and the physical digital divide a safe place to be. So I think definitely engage with the community. I, I have to do a plug for Trust Over IP because I, I, uh, I joined it. And IBM obviously has been a founder of it since the beginning, but I, I uh, got involved about two years ago and I now sit in the steering committee. Um, and I've just learned so much. I got to know like, through the Good Help Pass Collaborative, you know, even though we, we maybe didn't get the big adoption, but it was a great networking opportunity. I got to meet so many different people. Um, there's so much knowledge and everybody is super generous with, you know, to, to you know, Heather's point about Indicio, just giving out, you know, stuff for free to really, you know, a, a rise, rising water, you know, rises all boats. So, so we, we, all of us want to be sharing our experiences. So I would say definitely get involved in the communities. Trust Over IP is one that I've had a great experience with. They do some really great work, really active, lots of interesting technical work groups as well for people who want to get hands on and roll up their sleeves and write code. Um, so yeah, that's, that's engage. And, and obviously talk to any of us during the event if you want to. We can obviously point you to, to places you can go. So I want to give an extra plug. Uh, again, Hyperledger, um, it's one, one thing I love about this community. It's, it's, it is about the code, but it's also about everything else you need to actually use and deploy the code, including the education. Um, so sponsoring the, the uh, Getting Started with SSI, that's a new course that's going to be available. Um, I, too, will give a plug. Uh, Trust of RIP, if you're interested, it has, has a um, uh, summit tomorrow afternoon. Um, I think it's 2 to 5.30. Uh, the Director of Strategic Engagements, Judith uh, Fleener, is here. There we are. Judith, stand up or put your, your hand up. If you're interested in Trust of RIP, that's... And it's, it's a sister organization to Hyperledger, so is the Decentralized Identity Foundation. And uh, it's growing. It's growing. I think there's going to be another announcement coming tomorrow. The interest in this space is intense. And, and I love that point. 
digital, if digital identity and digital wallets and digital credits are in our future, then we're at that point where Elastigirl said, right? Your identity is your most valuable possession. Protect it. Use your powers. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.